Good afternoon, and uh, thank you for, uh, for attending this session, um, which follows the, uh, the amazing conversation between Greg Brockman and, and President Armacost. Um, so welcome to those here in attendance in the UND Memorial Union, as well as those joining online. Uh, we did hear that fascinating conversation between President Armacost and Greg Brockman, uh, President of OpenAI and co-creator of the generative AI tool ChatGPT. And I want to just sincerely thank Greg for, uh, for making time in what I know is an incredibly busy schedule to, uh, to be with us here today. Uh, it was our, our honor and privilege to, to have him as a guest. But we now turn our attention to a panel of UND experts to continue the discussion. I'm Ryan Zier, Professor and Chair of Mathematics and UND's Associate Vice President for Strategy and Implementation. I'm honored to be joined by a panel of colleagues as part of this discussion individuals who have been thinking deeply about artificial intelligence, either as part of their disciplinary work or relative to its emerging role in how we educate students. With me are Ryan Adams, Professor and Associate Dean for Research and National Security in the College of Engineering and Mines, uh, Emily Cherry Oliver, Professor and Chair of Theater Arts, Patrick Schultz, Professor of Entrepreneurship and Management, Carolyn Williams, Assistant Professor of Law, Bryce Christofferson, Assistant Professor of Mathematics, and Anna Kinney, Coordinator of the University Writing Program. My very sincere thanks to all of you for being part of this panel today, and I ask you all to, uh, to join me in welcoming the panelists to the stage. So our panel is titled The Promise and Peril of AI in Higher Education, which is uh, obviously quite a, quite a large topic. But to get us started, and uh, keeping in mind that our audience contains uh, you know, people with varied backgrounds, I'm, I'm wondering if uh, Drs. Adams and Christofferson can tell us a little bit about what artificial intelligence is. Sure, let me, let me take a minute, um, get calibrated. Um, so again, very, very simply, Greg gave a really good description. Um, essentially what we're looking at is training a computer, and in the case of a Turing test, a computer to interact with a human in the same way another human would do so, right? So it, it, we're, we're trying to teach the computer to become human-like. We typically do that, and, and one way to break it up is, is two different ways. You have either a biological approach, meaning I'm gonna, gonna organize my computer or my code in a way that mimics the way the human brain operates, or the biology approach. The second is the human learning approach. We're gonna treat this computer and we're gonna train that computer sort of like we would train a child, and eventually it'll grow up and become intelligent enough to answer questions. Um, both avenues of research have, have grown, and what, what Greg mentioned earlier is that deep learning, or, or neural nets, follows the first, the biological approach, it was sort of suppressed for a very long time as we've studied how people learn and come up with machine learning and other things like that. And now in more recent years, we've gone back to neural nets and created deep learning and other things that are following more on the biological side of things. Uh, it, it's my opinion moving forward that those are gonna continue to merge together. But again, from a, from a study point of view, we typically think either biologically or, or how humans um, learn. I think that was a really great answer. And I think if you're trying to first get into understanding any of this stuff, it can feel really overwhelming and kind of uh, confusing the dizzying menagerie of models and different techniques and variations stacked on variations uh, going back for decades in terms of the different algorithms and approaches and structures that we've used to try to do these things. Um, and in in, in a big way, you can kind of almost ignore that. You should care about the technical specifics if you're doing technical details with these things, but fundamentally, just remember that what we're going for in a big way when we talk about these things is, like you said, some kind of a mimicry of what you're used to seeing other people do. There's a deeper question about what intelligence actually is and whether we are achieving an artificial form of it or something that just superficially appears to display the characteristics of things that we would say are intelligent. And that is a worthwhile question to answer. But for the most part, you can just think about, hey, is this acting like a person? And I think we're starting to see things that are acting a whole lot more like people than anything we've really seen before. And we're gonna see a lot more of that. Thanks to you both. And uh, so now if we, we have a, you know, a sense of what this thing is, and so let's talk a little bit about some of its implications. Of course, our focal point being higher education. 
So could each of you give an example or prediction about the way AI is affecting the work done in your field or discipline? And feel free to start wherever, uh, Anna or yeah, anyone. Yeah, I'll start. Um, so I work in writing studies, and we have been doing research and writing studies for many years. We have a uh, significant, sorry. We have a significant basis of research and conversations around this. And so some of you might remember the article that was published in The Atlantic in January by Stephen Marsh, and its title was The College Essay is Dead. And it started a real panic around this. Well, later he was interviewed on a podcast that I listened to, and he recounts a conversation he had with his high school son, where his son said, well, I guess they're going to have to stop teaching us to write like machines and start teaching us to write like humans. And so I think, for me, that was a fundamental, pivotal moment in my understanding of what this meant for writing studies and for voice and for pursuing connections between humans that are uh, built through reading and writing. So my hope and um, kind of my prediction for our field is that we will continue to um, foster um, people's voice, their unique, authentic voices, and opportunities to connect in meaningful ways with one another, with and without these tools. But we're going to have to uh, figure out what that means. Uh, yeah, in mathematics, I think we were actually affected by this um, by far simpler tools than other disciplines quite a long time ago. Uh, it's, it, it has been no secret that most calculus students can do most of their homework problems by plugging it into Wolfram Alpha or a variety of other tools for quite a long time. And so I don't think that this has had quite as big an impact on mathematics. Um, I think we were hit by earlier and simpler things that don't really resemble intelligence so much as just uh, you know um, well-designed user interfaces. Um, but. I think it will start to change the discipline of mathematics as these things begin to write proofs, and particularly at the graduate level, and it will be a lot more difficult to, to assess the quality of a student's proof writing abilities and the degree to which they understand some of these, uh, these, these concepts that people do struggle to wrap their heads around. I think that will be um, a confusing line we have to, have to it's something we have to grapple with, and I don't know how we will. Um, I have a lot of ideas about that, but I'm sure we'll be able to talk about it more later. So contrary to um, popular belief, lawyers don't get in the courtroom a ton, and what we do mostly is write. Um, that's, and that's what I teach is legal writing and research. What will really revolutionize the legal writing field and the legal field will be when uh, Lexis and Westlaw, the two largest uh, legal databases of research uh, and authority, um, are coupled with this technology. And Lexis Plus um, announced in May that they are really close to developing and releasing Lexis Plus AI, which will take the power of um, generative text and couple it with being able to pull information from a live database that's current and that also cites to information that it uses in its responses. That's going to revolutionize the way that lawyers write, how they research, what they ask, and what they're going to need to know. Um, it will be able to, from what we've seen, Lexis um, hasn't released it yet, but they have given many, many uh, web, uh, webinars uh, and so that we could see this in progress and how it's being developed. And they plan on releasing it sometime at the end of the fall at least to law professors. So for what we've seen from it now, um, it's able to write memos, write different briefs for attorneys, and give attorneys an opportunity to make sure that it's not hallucinating to be able to look back at the different resources that um, Lexis Plus AI is looking at. And that's going to um, help lawyers to do their jobs more efficiently. They're gonna be able to write these types of documents much more quickly and hopefully to be able to um, change the, to lower the price of legal services, to get justice and reform for, for groups of people that um, need pro bono services or who need a lower cost of services. So I think that it's going to revolutionize it in that way. So from the, the business perspective, uh, the business field, there's a lot of different fields in that, but I think what you're going to see and what you probably already know is that this kind of technology is already affecting many aspects of business 
already companies are already engaged in trying to figure out how to use uh, AI to, uh, in various forms to optimize their activities, um, reduce product development time. Um, there are all kinds of interesting applications. Uh, bi a big one would be in pharmaceuticals, for instance. It takes up to $4 billion to uh, design a new drug and bring it to market and 10 years uh, of time to go through all the trials. You can imagine that there's a great incentive for companies in that field to reduce that amount of time. Um, and some uh, uh, Business Week, I know, reported that the, some of the speed at which we got treatments for COVID-19 were a result of using AI tools. So from a, from a, a business perspective, you'll see lots of different applications in, in many different areas. From an academic perspective, I think the biggest issue there that I've seen um, as an editor of a journal is trying to figure out wh where are we going to allow AI uh, in terms of uh, how are we going to allow it as a, as a tool to be used in the research and writing process. And that's something that's still uh, up for debate right now, so we haven't really uh, decided on how that should, should play out. For the arts and humanities, I think the most public is the writer strike and the actor strike um, in film and television right now. Uh, the idea of authorship and having AI author write scripts or utilizing an actor's image um, without their consent for the rest of time um, is kind of the, the arguments that that um, the unions are trying to make right now. Along those lines, I think in general in the arts and humanities, authorship is the big question right now. Um, Greg Brockman talked about, you know, putting in uh, some text to create an image makes us all artists. Yes, absolutely. But then I like that he followed up saying, but that art is all going to be almost um, mediocre, and so we need those humans to create um, the new and innovative ideas. So, but if you are partnering with AI, who is the author? Who gets credit? Um, is still is still a big debate, and I don't know that we have those answers right now. So, in the area of, of engineering and computing, um, we have a, a little bit of a mix. Uh, in computing, often we teach students how to write code, which is not the same as writing an essay, but it is the same in the sense of, of chat GPT. You can put a prompt in and chat GPT will write a code for you, write a, a functioning program for you. So, we have a lot of the same challenges that we're trying to solve in a computing discipline. From a, an engineering and application discipline, I can see the sky is the limit and beyond. They're, they're, AI up till chat GPT has been very application specific. You train an AI to solve a very particular problem and then it can do amazing things in that context. Moving to general purpose AI like, like, chat, G, or like chat GPT does allows us to solve increasingly complex problems that can have incredible impacts on life. You, you mentioned the, the, the pharmaceutical industry. That's absolutely an important part. Diagnostics, looking at, at slides and images and other things and being able to identify salient features is another one. There are so many others. Imaging things and telling when, when plants are, are diseased or, or have pests on them. A lot of those kinds of things we can now do that we could not do before because it was just so complicated. So from an engineering and an application standpoint, this is an incredibly exciting time. We then have the teaching and training part where we have to figure out how we're gonna train our students to do what we need them to do, to think how we need them to think without just reverting to this incredibly convenient tool. So thanks to you all for, for those responses. And you know, they largely were getting at you know, ways that you know, we might imagine using or that students and, and others in the discipline are using already. What would you consider to be a line that we can't cross? In other words, ways that we should not be using these tools. Well, for fear of just getting us going down the line here, I'll, I'll start. So one of the things I think um, is connection. When AI removes opportunities to connect, I think that is, and Greg talked about this in his conversation as well, 
Um, that is really the heart of what we do in education is connecting with one another, connecting with students, connecting with ideas, connecting with ideas from the past. That's the whole synthesizing where we've been um, to imagine what if, where we might go from there. So I think a line is when we use AI as a substitute for connection and remove the people um, and the human elements that keep us connected through education. I'm firmly in the camp that writers deserve, human writers deserve human readers, and human readers deserve um, human writers. There is a lot of connection that happens there, and that doesn't preclude the opportunity to use these tools to, to connect, and it might invite more people into that conversation. But I think connection needs to be foregrounded in all of our conversations about this. How do we think about this as an opportunity to connect better um, and not lose sight of the value of um, what we bring as empathetic, compassionate human people. Indeed, I think that's a really good point. And uh, there's, I fundamentally think we should be careful about drawing any particular lines about like, don't, don't use this part or do this here. I think the thing we should be very clear to focus on is the, uh, the outcome of these things. There may be ways that you could do something in one situation that are using the tool in exactly the same way as another situation, but have dramatically different outcomes that are, one is desirable, one is highly undesirable. Um, in mathematics, particularly at like a, the high research level, there are lots of fields where there are very, very few people who work in them. Um, like sometimes we're talking less than 10. And I think that's something we're gonna have to really focus on in the future here as these things get better, particularly with graduate education, is that there will be a, a desire to rely on these machines and, and, and just broadly these tools so that we don't have to understand some of the hard parts of these ideas or don't have to contend with them in the same way as we did before. And this is fine in practice for many things, but we can quickly reach a situation where there are no longer any humans that necessarily understand the forefront of an area of research. And that, I think, is something we should try very hard to avoid. We should make sure that we at least kind of try to keep pace with what we're using these tools for so we can know where we're going. We should, we should have our eyes on the road when we're driving, at least. And uh, I think that's, that's the line in the sand I have. I don't know that I have a line in the sand, but there is something that I've been thinking about, and that's the idea of, as, as writing teachers and professors, um, we give a lot of feedback. And I, I would hesitate to give feedback to students by running it through something like ChatGPT and running it through generative AI. You absolutely can. You can get feedback on any kind of written product that you can run through. Um, and if you haven't played around with the paid version of ChatGPT, you can put something like 50 pages into it. So quite, quite a lot of pages. And, and I think it kind of harkens back to what Anna was saying about that connection. As a professor, one of the things I want to do is be able to connect with my students personally and understand where it is they might be struggling. Because by the time that I have read a student's papers that they've written for me three, four, five times, I all of a sudden get a sense of, who they are as a person and where they're struggling in their analysis and where they're struggling um, with the substance of what they're writing about. And that's such a, a personal thing as a professor. I would, I personally would not uh, want to use generative AI in that way to give feedback to my students. So as an educator, that's my line. This is kind of a, a hard question for me to consider because um, I, I'm an engineer by undergraduate training, even though I'm uh, in the business school here. Um, and so I have a fascination with tools and uh, using gadgets and devices and technology of all sorts to accomplish my work. And so I, I, my, my predisposition is I would like to try to use this in as many uh, ways that I can. Um, uh, on the other hand, it, within my academic society, or we had a meeting early in March, and we were considering this question of like, well, what we're going to, what are we going to allow in our journals? And um, there was a very strong uh, call for banning outright any use of generative AI tools. And I can certainly see how you'd want to to do that because we're engaged in creating you know, some intellectual product, and we don't want to pass off the work of a, an AI as our own work. And um, 
and so there, there, are some, so there are some problems with that. But on the other hand, I, I find it hard to ban the use of a generative AI in applications that are basically similar. So if I use uh, ChatGPT to help me create a short case study for use in class, well, the, the system's fast enough and powerful enough to where I could do that in the hours before a class. Now, that's basically what some people in my academic profession would say they'd want to ban. And, but I think that's okay. So I think we're gonna have to learn some norms about what is gonna be acceptable here. And it's still a little bit early. So I was able to get the, my society to put off putting these policies in place um, as we try to figure out what is and isn't appropriate. Yeah, I, I'm hesitant to uh, draw a line in the sand because I think right now, um, if a student was going to write a paper, I think generative AI and chat GPT, GPT is very good at mediocrity. I think that it's th that it will get a paper that is fine. Um, but a year from now, I can't guarantee that. So I think where I lean toward are the ethics, and that's where humans need to be a part of creating the ethics around the tool. Um, and what that looks like today will not be what it looks like five years from now, um, but we cannot let the technology get ahead of us so much that we are ignoring the ethics because of the novelty of what we have. Um, so in terms of what is or is, is not allowed in the, in the classroom, I think it, it is a challenging question to ask because what this will look like in a year could be completely different. I'd add one, one piece to this. From In my mind, I would prefer not to use an AI that does not also come with it the need for me to understand why it came to the solution it came or, or the answer it came to, right? If, if I used it to grade, for example, a paper, which I can't imagine doing, but if I did, I'd need to actually read through it and say, yes, that makes sense. I understand why that grade came out the way it did. But from a technical point of view, it's incredibly important for me as a researcher to understand why the AI gave the answer it did so that I can gain intuition to the next conclusion, the next research question, the next thing that we need to, to, to solve. So again, understanding the why, not just the answer, but intuition as to what's going on in the physical world or, or whatever else we're dealing with. So something I heard as we we're all talking about this is um, the need for transparency around how we are using things, how are we are asking others to engage in it so that we can navigate this together. I think that that is something that is going to help us make decisions about where lines in the sand lie for different fields and for different purposes and for different audiences, right? That rhetorical question that we're in. And the other thing I heard too is this notion, I think it's Peter Elbow, who's a scholar of writing that talks about as we read something, we're not just getting someone's idea, we are experiencing their thought process. And I think that's something uh, that seems like a theme here too, is that that is a space that we start to brush up against, that we can maybe navigate better with more transparency. Well, and I just throw in there, and isn't that what we're trying to teach our students as well, as that, as this new technology develops, I don't have the answers. I am not an expert on, even though I'm on a panel, um, but in terms of like how chat GPT works and how exactly every facet of my discipline uses it. But I think it's very important to rem remind our students that, that I don't have all the answers, but let's work together on the research, on the analysis. Let's figure this problem out together. And that modeling behavior is exactly what we want to teach our students in the first place. That, yeah, I can tell you some things about theater, but in terms of all the investigative ideas, um, that's, that's the fun process that we can do together. Be curious. One of the big uh, questions in the law, of course, is citation and whether or not we should attribute um, to text that's written by ChatGPT or other generative AI um, as such, because in the law, every sentence has to have an attribution to some sort of law or some sort of case, um, because our rule of law is built on precedent. Um, and so, I, <laughs> interestingly enough, even though I, I authored a citation manual, I don't recommend um, citing to what ChatGPT has helped students write. And part of that is because 
um, of how I want to teach them to use it, and because I look at other um, tools that they're using, such as Grammarly, that also has AI in it, and we're not asking them to students to cite to that. We're not asking students to cite to Word that asks, that does spell check for them. And there are so many other things that we are using as tools to create something. And to me, um, ChatGPT is always going to be something that we use as a tool as human beings. And so, um, I, I, there's a huge discussion in the legal writing community about whether we should uh, do this or not. I'm on the side of, of I, don't, I don't think we should any more than I would cite to any other tool that I was using to write. That doesn't take away the students or, or any lawyers or my um, obligation to check that information, make sure that it's correct, make sure it is cited to other, where other rules of law are, but I just don't think as a tool that it should be cited. So let me just build on that. I, I think that uh, you know it's it seems strange to me to to cite uh, a generative AI tool as an author of something. It doesn't seem to me that it is an author. It's just it is just this software that's churning things out. But I think we do have um, we do have models in other areas that could serve us uh, in, in terms of being transparent with how we use AI. So for instance, in many types of research, if we use a statistical package, for instance, we might be, uh, we might be called on to cite the use of that statistical package. Um, and in the same way, I think we might find it useful to cite if we use ChatGPT site, that you use that. Or we will probably need to, like I said before, develop new norms around how we express, how we use a particular tool. I think that's something that we're gonna develop over time. It may not look like the way we've been using, using or citing uh, statistical uh, software, but it might also be uh, something there that we could use to, to communicate how we used it and, and that we did use it. I think it's very valuable to have some sort of acknowledgement of like the involvement of this tool there. Um, and maybe it's something that looks different than a citation, some sort of new attribution mark we do on something. Um, I, 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 I heard this somewhere. Uh, the, the, I know that there's um, certain metals used for like high precision um, devices that they have to harvest from shipwrecks because all metals above ground were exposed to radiation during the testing of the bomb. And uh, now we have to rely on this source of uh, non-irradiated metal for certain high precision devices. I wonder if the same kind of thing will happen if we don't at least give ourselves some sort of markings of what things were created by generative models versus people. Will it become essentially impossible for us to distinguish um, what, what things were our products versus things that weren't? And this maybe is not a big deal on some ethical level, but it might be practically very annoying trying to sort through everything and figure out what came from where. I, I will say a federal court has ruled against an artist that created a work of art in Colorado um, that they said that it was created by generative AI and they took the artist's award away um, because they said it wasn't um, enough created by a human. So people are already starting to push back um, in, in, in case of authorship. I think there's been questions too about whether it is a human right to know whether something is generated by AI, something that you are reading and engaging with. I think it's the UN that has brought this up. Is that a human right um, to navigate this information safely? So uh, as you can see, uh, once you get these conversations started, they just, uh, they're, they're self-sustaining. Um, so I apologize for uh, interrupting because I think we could have continued on that thread for the rest of the time and I see that there are some questions coming in from, uh, from audience members, but I am going to, before we get to that, ask a question that came up in an email conversation Carolyn and I had before the panel, uh, because I think it's, it's an important one, and, and I know Greg touched on this a bit earlier as well, but it has to do with um, you know, how might AI improve the, how might AI both improve and worsen educational accessibility and equity? Ooh, I'll take that one really quickly. Um, I'm really interested, and one of the reasons I became interested in ChatGPT and all this generative AI is this idea of accessibility. Um, because I've researched and looked at 
uh, students who come to school with ADHD and with dysgraphia, which is a writing disability, and the hurdles that they have to face um, in their education. And I've had some students with these, um, with this disability, and I have just uh, wanted to explore how ChatGPT and other generative AI could help those students who are brilliant, who can talk to me at length about case law and really deep, in-depth conversations, but really struggle to communicate uh, that knowledge and uh, that they have in writing. And um, I think that this is just a new area that will help students who have those types of learning disabilities um, to really level the playing field and to be able to show what it is that they do know. I think on the other side, considering some of the risks around this, I think the promise of accessibility is one that we should continue to hold these AI companies accountable to provide, because it's a promise uh, of a better future, right? That hopeful future that we ended our conver previous conversation on. On the other side, I think uh, these can be inequity uh, magnifiers. Um, there's a great book by Virginia Eubanks called Automating um, Inequality, where it looks at that. I think in the spirit of big data being what is driving this. We need to continue to prioritize small data, lived experiences, personal anecdotes. Um, when we think of things like putting things behind cost walls, right, already features of ChatGPT that could radically change people's access are behind a paywall. Um, these systems aren't available in some countries. For example, Egypt um, does not have access to ChatGPT. So we need to be mindful of who has access and how that changes. And there was a great blog post in the APA blog about uh, a potential byproduct of a changing expectation around productivity and how rapidly we can be productive. And what happens, thinking is slow. A lot of our problems are slow problems, right? Slow ideas to um, borrow from Atul Gawande. Um, these are things that require substantial time and revision and process work um, in order to arrive at sustainable conclusions and, and opportunities. And so we need to be mindful of not letting those be dictated by the speed at which computer systems can, can help us move along and make sure that we still have space for different ways of coming to problems and problem solving and holding spaces accountable to make sure that this is accessible. And important to note, AI is biased. And, uh, and can be very much focused on a gender, um, a, uh, a race, and those that are other um, are, can be alienated by this tool. So I think it's very important that um, the technology learns uh, how to be more inclusive, um, but then also that when we are interacting with it as educators, um, we make sure to remind our students those things. Well, we'll, uh, we'll go to uh, one of the questions coming in from the audience. So the recent boom in AI has created competition within the industry and disruption in many areas. What have been some of the most positive examples of this in business, higher ed, et cetera? I just asked the questions. You all, you all get the answers. <laughs> one thing that I saw that I think um, has, has, will be just universally loved by every student is uh, improvements to online homework systems. Um, I think everybody has typed an answer into an online homework system, pressed enter, seen that they, 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 they put in 15 and it says wrong. The answer is 15.0. And you're like, oh. They're fixing this. I've seen um, some very nice, uh, very nice systems to try to get around some of this, um, look at some of the more the variety of different ways that you can express an answer in equivalent forms and still have all of them be right. And uh, hopefully that small disruption saves a lot of people a lot of headache. So as I mentioned before, I think there's, there's a lot of very interesting targeted um, solutions that we've been able to make. That's just going to continue uh, to go down the way in terms of research. Now, as research, we, we, we think of university research as developing the latest and greatest ideas, but it invariably trickles down into the undergraduate and high school and, and so on. And so as those research advances mature, they will move further and further down. And I, I would suspect there's a significant amount of AI component to Wolfram Alpha, for example, and other tools that we're bumping into every day already. So again, some very, very, very challenging but important problems are being solved now, and I think that's just gonna continue to accelerate as the tools become more and more pronounced. 
Yeah, dis disruptions feel like opportunities. I mean, there is a lot of shock in them, of course. And one thing I think has been hopeful and encouraging about the future of this is watching educators come together and share resources. There was an excellent paper published, I think, in June by Anna Mills, Mahabali, and Lance Eaton, and it's all about open educational practice. Um, and in it, the thesis is, you know, um, be share early, share rough, and be curious. And I think that there has been opportunities for folks to connect and share perspectives of what this looks like on the ground. I've heard this described as a field medicine situation where things are changing and we have real realities on the ground that we have to continue to move through even as we don't know for sure where we're going or if the way we've chosen is the best, but we get to revise and we get to connect with one another. And so I think disruptions, although shocking, what I have seen is a real um, kind of shock proofing, which is a community engagement with this and an encouragement to be curious and to try. Um, Anthropic, which is another AI company that's competing with OpenAI, um, if you read through their job openings, et cetera, um, you know, their requirements is a liberal arts education, a curiosity, a willingness to be um, wrong, um, a willingness to ask questions, but one of their goals is to prioritize answers that don't end up the way they thought they would just as much as finding, you know, the positive, affirming this is what we thought was going to happen. So I think that there's a shift that we make at times of disruption that allow us to dig deeper into our values um, and maybe relocate or re- uh, orient our, our choices to ensure that those are the values that we continue to support um, and that maybe the way we've done that in the past isn't the best way moving forward. So, so this is an interesting question for me uh, because um, I think all of these companies, these AI companies, also have uh, investors and the investors that are helping support and fund the development of these uh, technologies are some very familiar names. So Microsoft, Google, and Meta. And if you uh, were reading the news this morning, you probably heard that Amazon just announced that they were gonna invest something like $4 billion in Anthropic. And so now Amazon, after waiting, you know, almost a year, has made a, a move in the space here. All of these companies see AI as disrupting their existing business models. And being involved in this new technology is an effort on their part to secure access to uh, and control the, the technology going forward. So we're going to see a lot of disruption here, just in the same way that we saw disruption around the advent of social media or the advent of search. Um, New, the New York Times reported that in December of last year, so it had only taken a month, and Google was reputedly calling for a code red. That's the label they put on it because they felt so threatened by this, uh, this new software startup, ChatGPT. So uh, it's... It's not necessarily a real positive thing here. There's a lot of negative, uh, uh, a feeling of threat. But um, I think what we're going to see is there's still a lot of this churn. We'll see in a couple of years how this plays out. But this, the, the fact that there are such large um, software technology companies behind this is also something that we should pay attention to in terms of a lot of the things we've talked about, like accessibility, for instance. Yeah, I mean, some of the points you're making, and of course, just the existence of this panel kind of speak to the, the profound potential changes that are, that are afoot and that we're, we're about to, uh, to see more of. Um, another audience question, OpenAI announced yesterday that ChatGPT is now capable to see, hear, and speak. Users will be able to have voice conversations with ChatGPT and include images in conversations. Some examples could be giving ChatGPT one or more images to help troubleshoot why a grill won't start, or to explore the contents in your fridge to plan a meal, or to analyze a complex graph for work-related data. As generative AI capabilities advance further, it seems that the ability to verify whether a student or user actually understands a concept will be harder to achieve. The question. Um, as about protecting creators from AI data scraping, the Authors Guild is suing OpenAI for stealing creator content. 
Uh, okay, so the question trails off at that point. But the, um, I, I, fundamentally, if I, if I interpret a little bit and read between the lines, you know, this, this interestingly, you know, just yesterday, right? So this idea that it is now even more capable than, uh, than heretofore. And so what do we um, do now? And I'm thinking, again, bringing this back to the higher ed context, you know, if, if, this, if the ability to use this tool in even more dramatic ways is here suddenly upon us less than a year uh, after it initially emerged um, as educators, I mean, we, how do we react? You know, Anna, you were saying a minute ago that we, you know, the, and, and Greg said it too, right? I mean, banning, like, there is an opportunity here. Banning is not the solution. What is the solution? Uh, somebody give me a job to answer yeah, that. Yeah, well, well, you don't have to go first, right? You've been going first all day, but... Uh, but. Um, I'll jump in really quick because um, I've been thinking about this idea. The, the question kind of started talking about, you know, how do we assess students, basically, is what it comes down to. I teach legal writing. How do I assess students in this, in this area where traditionally um, in the first year legal writing courses, uh, students get a lot of formative assessment, but their big summative assessment is really the end product of, of at the end of a semester, they're graded on an end written product. And so I thought a lot about this over the summer, thinking how do I change my first year class so that I can make sure that the students are really learning the skills that they need to be able to um, assess and revise writing and to understand uh, the concepts that are being written about, whether they're writing it themselves or whether it's generative AI or whether they're analyzing someone else's writing. Um, and so a lot of what I've done is make sure that in my class there are a lot of opportunities for students to do other things besides just write or to write in different contexts. So for example, my students are writing in teams. I utilize team-based learning, which um, requires students to do some multiple choice tests, both individually outside of class and then in class as a team. They do a lot of team exercises. Um, there are a lot of other opportunities for students to get different grades, um, including through oral reports and other things like that. So, so there are ways for us to, to um, really assess student learning, but we might have to turn away from the idea that it's going to just be based on their writing alone. So going back to the question a little bit, they're, they're talking about scraping, um, AI scraping of, of data. And that, that, what that means basically is the AI goes out and, and identifies all of my information and consolidates it or, or, or all of your information. So there's, there's a privacy question that, that then arises and therefore there's a potential legal question that, that comes up. It's real easy to say I have this object in my home physically, it's private. But when I have something stored on a database somewhere, someone might use it. And, and there are very real privacy questions, there's real, very real um, legal questions, especially at a university when, when we have this requirement to not release student data. If I somehow upload a student uh, homework set or something to a, a, an AI, it could conceivably be visible by anybody across the world and that would be a violation of a federal law, for example. And so there's a lot of, of intellectual property questions, copyright questions, privacy questions, and now it just, just broadened to, to spoken word and, and images and video and all. So again, there's, there's just sort of this underlying personal privacy. At what point does my data just become public and, and, and when does it not? I think it's important, again, we've said this over and over, it's not going away. Um, I think we are getting better at teaching our students, ourselves, that the written word online is, is permanent. We can't take that away. Photographs are permanent, and now we just have another layer of that that we need to be educated on. So again, it's keeping up with that technology. And then in terms of authorship, that again will be a legal question that we will have to be answering for quite a while. There is a difficult question in all of this, and I think it's, uh, I, I would call everyone to try to disentangle in your mind the, uh, the, the, the piece that loves the creation of new things, the piece that loves the creation of new art or uh, mathematics or whatever you are using these tools to make, and the piece that cares about securing social and economic uh, 
recognition or compensation in some sense. And I don't mean to diminish that. We all need resources to live. We all are humans in a society. Um, we, we, we care about being recognized for the work we do. But on some level, I, I hope that people can move those two things apart in their minds and see the creation of new things as being fundamentally good and the uh, lack of the necessary compensation to the people who um, help us create those new things is the bad part and not as if those two things are at odds um, and that we are, are, are pro the creation of new things and not anti the creation of new things just because it might be tied in its current instantiation to a system that doesn't do nice compensation benefits. Um, and so I think that if we, we move those two pieces apart, we get a lot nicer picture. And um, when we talk about teaching, it's sort of the same thing. Um, a lot of the reason, uh, we've talked a lot about it, the good ways that this can help us in the classroom, but one of the big ways that it impacts most of us is with cheating and bad actors. And a big question that I think we'll have to contend with is, why do we care so much? If people will just use this outside of the classroom, why do we care that they're using it in the classroom? And we say, well, because we want understanding in those things. But if the student doesn't want understanding, why are we forcing it upon them? Uh, it's an interesting question. We should provide avenues for learners who do want understanding to attain it. But what's the point otherwise? And I don't know the answer to that. I, I think I would just add something that's been really important to me in these conversations for the last 10 or so months is also being cognizant of the emotional effect that this has on us and the grief that people are in as this changes rapidly and um, the grief around, especially for educators, right? Not being educated in the way we were educated, losing beloved assignments, um, you know, the, the rapid change, we're tired, we've had a pandemic, somehow harder than a, leaving for a pandemic was coming back from a pandemic. And now this, there's been tremendous disruptions where we've been asked to dig in fully, um, identify our values and reconfigure everything to meet a new world, you know, and at stake is our students' future, our community's future. So I think in all of this, there's a tremendous emotional component um, to be mindful of for yourself as you navigate that in our interactions with others as we, um, you know, engage in compassionate, thoughtful conversations about what people um, worry about and what they've lost and what they feel hopeful around. I think that that will help guide some of this compassionately. And the other thing is that a budget is a, is a moral document, right? If you value art, if you value writing, support artists. You know, we have power as um, folks um, with a pocketbook and with our attention and our time. And there are so many choices we can make to continue to support those things. So I would just add that. You know, the, the time is never long enough for, uh, for conversations like this. Um, I predict we could, we could be for, here for hours, right? Uh, and we would, we would uncover more uh, incredibly interesting uh, topics for discussion. But as we end our time today, I want to thank all of you for your, your time and attention and for being here as part of this uh, discussion. And I want you to, as we end, uh, help me thank our panelists for their incredible insights. And thank you all for coming. Have a good day.